He's going to speak in tongues tonight. So <laughs> anyway, so first I'm going to do what I always do when I get the chance to minister and, and share the Lord with people and what he's doing. And that is I'm going to honor my mom and my dad. You know, when I did my paper, I did a dedication page to them. And, um, and I got a kick out of thinking, you know, it was their great idea. They thought they had this really great idea to have a baby. But it wasn't their idea after all. They were just the vessels. And so, um, so I honor my mom and my dad who are in heaven tonight with the Lord. And mom and daddy, I love you. And I thank God that they, although they're part of my past, they're in my future. And so one of the things that I love uh, that I'm discovering, too, is that God, and it's a joy to me, that he's given me the ability to express myself in words and paint pictures in writing. And I so appreciate that. And um, even since coming to the school, that thing has been really enhanced. And so thank God for that. And so just as God said it's good when he created something, I feel like I can say the same thing about my thesis because my heart is full and satisfied in the Lord tonight over this little creation that he has given to me. Um, and then as far as acknowledgments, I'm sorry that George Parrott's not here. But I just want to honor Rick first, you know, for having Morningstar, being obedient to the Lord, because the university would not be here had he not been obedient to the Lord. I suppose God could have raised someone else up. I'm so thankful to them, um, and so to George and Anna for their sacrifice and their obedience to the Lord for the MSU staff and for making sure that the, the school does continue to operate like a well-oiled machine. So uh, if they're going to listen to this, just whether they're up front or behind the scenes, that God is using you to be an influential blessing worldwide, and I just honor that. Um, and then last of all, there's also people that God uses to water the garden in our heart. And uh, Nancy, God has used you in that way in this season of my life. Um, so I honor you for all that you sacrifice, many hours that are unseen by people but watched by God closely, both near and far away. Um, not your job, it is your calling, and that's very evident. And as you said a few weeks ago, I love this quote, I have to join a vision that's bigger than me and bigger than my lifetime. Whatever happens to me, it's going to carry on. I'm just joining God at work. So I honor your obedience to the Lord. And as my paper says, because it's a sure sign of loving God. And so thank you for provoking me to love and know more about God and to know him. Um, I appreciate that. So then, you know, I would say, may we continue to join him as he joins us. Um, and those he joins us with in making an eternal difference wherever his narrow path may lead right into eternity. Okay, so who is God? And that's just such a vast subject, but this I know, that within God's heart we won't find any trace of wanting us to have a superficial relationship with him because when it's a religious experience, it drains the life out of intimacy. And his goal all along has been to be intimate with people, that we experience the height, depth, the width, and breadth of his love, according to Ephesians 3. And I feel that the deep place in God is calling to the deep place in us. Uh, Psalm 42, 7. Of course, God is not far off. He's omnipresent. And so he's everywhere at one time. He's there with you all, and he's here with me tonight. He's omniscient, knowing all things. And he's omnipotent, all-powerful, to whom no one can compare. I love this. He's the everlasting father. You know, not everybody has a good father, human father, but God is the best. And he's the source of everything that we need, which pertains to life and godliness. And he's promised never to leave us or forsake us. Um, and I'm so grateful to him for that. And I love this. Even though he sits enthroned in the heavens above, he wants to be our hiding and our abiding place. And that's according to Psalm 113.5 and Psalm 91.1. And this is amazing to me that he desires for us to be his dwelling place, even though we're imperfect. 
Ephesians 2.22. So I've discovered a lot about his, uh, is it okay to say I've discovered a lot? About his nature and his character and his attributes. And I was thinking about how when Moses asked him, so who are you? And God said, I am that I am. And to me, uh, the Holy Spirit lit on that. And he said, I am that. Whatever that is that you need, I am. And so we might also hear the Lord saying, I am that I am. But we might hear him whisper to us, but who do you say that I am? Just like Jesus asked Peter. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit had revealed to Peter who Jesus was. And he even confirmed that it was the Holy Spirit. And I think that the question about who God is resonates in the mind of every person because I think he's etched that onto our, onto our heart by his spirit, the desire to search for him. But we forget sometimes, I was thinking about how um, I call it having a hazy brain or a fog-laden brain. We forget about the promises of God because of the fallen world we live in. And we, we so see things in the natural that it's easy to forget about the things in the spirit because they're not so tangible. But he has promised that if we seek him, we will find him if we seek with our whole heart, according to Jeremiah 30, uh, 29, 11 through 13. And again, disappointments have a way of leaving people with a tainted perspective of God, unfortunately. And uh, the Lord was showing me in this process that a lot of the problem is that people see him as if he's been made in the image of God, uh, image of man, rather than us who have been made in his image. And it's an identity issue, really. That's what it comes down to. But God, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways, according to Isaiah 55. Also, there is no fear in God, and this world is full of fear. So if we're in him, we are not afraid, because his love is perfect, and it casts out all fear. He's calling for us to come close to him, according to James, James 4, 8. And he desires that we walk and talk with him, in, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. He wants to take us back to that place and restore us back to that place, which is possible through the new birth. And when, uh, when I started putting this paper together, this, I'm just going to read this paragraph, if that's okay. The facets of God are so vast, it's like trying to contain an ocean in a thimble or capturing a comet in a bottle like a firefly, yet God chooses to dwell in people. And I just love that he's so big. What's impossible is possible with God. What's impossible with man is possible with God. And he chooses to live inside of us. And uh, Jesus enables us to live a separated life to the Lord. Um, desiring to be inseparable from him. I love that. And that covenant relationship is the entrance into a sacred holy place, which isn't a location, but it is God's heart, where we share communion and revelation about who he is. So where did God come from? He's just always been, and he always will be, according to Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1. And I'm just going to read uh, Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And the Lord, um, as I was thinking about creation, he allowed me somehow to see in space and time. I don't understand how it happened. I just know I was sitting on the couch, and then I just had this, whether it was a mini vision or whether I was actually there, I don't know. But I know that um, when I realized what I was seeing, it snapped me out of it. And then I said, take me back, take me back, take me back. Um, because um, I was allowed to see what earth looked like. I said, let me see that. And he let me see it. And I think he made it look like a marble because we see the globe. I mean, that's what we relate to. But it was black and it, it wasn't formless, but it was empty and it was dark. There was nothing. It was just total black. And it was suspended in space. And I believe that is what it looked like. Um, at least that's the way he showed it to me. Even though it was formless, you know, it was because he hadn't formed anything yet. It was just there. But it was suspended. And the fact that all the planets are suspended in space and God holds the stars in place 
is just quite an amazing thing. Um, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, according to Revelation 117. And he was talking to me about the wind and how we can't hold it in our hands, but we can see and feel its effects. Um, you know, the things that happen, like it blows through a tree, and we can see the leaves moving, or we can hear them rustling, and we can see as the seasons change, the autumn leaves falling to the ground from where they've been. Um, we can, when there's a summer breeze coming off the ocean, there's a fragrance that it carries and a taste of salty air, like a mist. And then, um, of course, hurricanes and tornadoes display a tremendous amount of power, and they're relentless as they often uproot or displace and humble anything in the destructive path. Um, Job, you know, that came to my mind, that Job experienced, they experienced a tornado, and some of his family members were killed, and uh, it, tore, it demolished their home. Um, the presence of God, though it's tangible, we can feel him, we can't see him, but he affects everything that encounters him. And his voice is like the sound of rushing waters. Um, you know, but he often whispers to my heart anyway, with love and affirmation and comfort. And those scriptures are um, Isaiah 59, 19 and Revelation 1, 15. So although he is invisible, his handiwork is seen and it leaves people without an excuse because God has made plain that he does exist, according to Romans 1.20. And the difference between the wind that he made and himself is that he can be housed in the heart of the believer. Mm -hmm. I just find that so interesting that the wind can't be contained, but God's spirit can live within the heart of a person or the spirit of a person. And he has placed eternity in our hearts. The wind of God and the breath of God are not visible, but they both have cause and effect. The wind of God can cause something which once was to be no more. And the breath of God gives life and also revives what was once dead. That's according to Acts 17.28 and Genesis 2.7. R.T. Kendall asked a question in Understanding um, Theology, Volume 1. Would man have come up with the God of the Bible? And basically, his answer was no, that he wouldn't. Um, he talks about Romans 1 also, that God reveals himself, that he makes it plain that he exists, and that um, John 1, 9 shows the entry point to every man's heart is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So um, even believing in God doesn't really, it really doesn't prove anything because the devil believes in God, and he knows his final doom, and he knows his time is short. So it's faith, it's by faith that we access through Jesus Christ, the, the Father. All right, so God is immortal, and uh, Webster's defines immortal as being exempt from death, exempt from oblivion, imperishable. And it also, it also defines eternal as having no beginning or no end, lasting forever. And that's our Father, that's who he is. He's our eternal refuge. He is spirit. He is supreme deity. He's holy. He is God Almighty, the righteous judge, and he's the author of salvation. And he is the only true God, John 17, 3. He's the loving creator. And the, so this is where I'm going to just kind of expound a little bit because I want to talk about him being such a loving creator. And I love... Um, I love astronomy myself. I've always loved science and stars and planets and all of that. And on my bucket list, I'm going to go to an observatory one day. And, uh, until I can sit above and look down, you know, with the Lord himself. And uh, I'm not, we may be seated in heavenly places, but I, I still want to do that. So God said, um, so, so Genesis 1-3, let me back up. It captures the essence of some of his creativity by saying, God said, God called, God made, God set, God created, God blessed, God ended his work, and God rested. Um, all things are from him, through him, and to him for his glory. 
and the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork, Psalm 19.1. So I want you all to close your eyes, because I want to try to paint this picture. And just imagine for a moment looking up into the heavens on a very clear night without any lights to skew your vision. And it can be like an amazing backdrop of black velvet glittered with innumerable twinkling stars, which God has created and individually named, according to one, uh, Psalm 147.4. Occasionally, there's a, a flying star, a falling star, or a shooting star that, that streaks across the sky. And just as quick as it was displayed, it burns out, yet the memory of that moment lingers. The stars sing to him. You can open your eyes now. <laughs> you can keep them close if you want to, but... <laughs> So I was thinking about the falling star or the shooting star and how that's indicative of our lives, that we're just here for a moment of time, and yet our memory does linger with people as we go on to be with the Lord. And if Jesus tarries, then some of us are going to see others go be with the Lord. We've, we've already seen that with friends and family. Um, but you know what? If I go first, I'll be there when you get there. And, but it's just we're a vapor. There's scripture that talks of us being like a vapor, a mist, and then we are no more. But I think it's amazing that the stars sing to him, that the heavens declare his glory. And even in science, they have proven these sounds that come, um, which is kind of amazing to me. It just confirms God's word. And so beholding what God has done sometimes, it can be overwhelming. I've had tears fill my eyes and because I remember that he t he's so careful with everything. He's so considerate, and he loves all he has made. I had read that there's so many stars and galaxies. At some point, the distance has, it cannot be measured in numbers of miles, but they have to start measuring in light years because it's incomprehensible. The sheer quantity of celestial bodies is almost beyond comprehension, and I love this. Though This is from Moody Bible Institute. And it's uh, a video that I watched called Wonders of God's Creation, the Milky Way, and our solar system. And one of the things they said was that though estimates continue to rise, it is believed there are at least 100 billion individual galaxies in the universe, many of them comprised of 200 billion stars or more. Mm. That alone shows God's vastness. Um, but I, I love that when it said the estimates continue to rise and they'll continue to rise because when God said, let there be light, he never told it to stop. And since his word is eternal, it will continue to create. And as far out as the Hubble telescope or any other telescope or anything that, that men can make, they will continue to find creation because God never told it to stop. I love that. That's um, there's an astronomer named James Jeans that was from England, and he speculated that the total number of stars in space could equal or surpass the total number of grains of sand on all the seashores of the entire world. It's pretty incredible. So God's words are powerful, and they accomplish that to which they have been sent. But above all of his, but above all his creations, there's one that stands out far above the rest, which he values more than any other. And he talks about it in Genesis 1.26. When the Trinity starts discussing making man in their image, God said, and I can't just imagine that God was saying, let's do it. Let's make them. Let's make them in our image, in our likeness. And then we're going to let them have dominion over everything, and it's just going to be great. I, I know that James, uh, King James didn't write it that way, but that's Debbie's interpretation. And so then, you know, there's like this dawning of hope for relationship between God and man. And I think they were so excited with anticipation. Um, you know, Wayne Grudem talks about in Systematic Theology that, it's ne it's, that the necessity for God to reveal himself, I mean, that's the way we know him, is he, re he reveals himself to us. Not only in nature, but primarily through the Word of God, through the Bible. And that the Bible alone tells us how to understand the testimony of God, about God from nature. Therefore, we depend on God's active communication 
to us in scripture for our true knowledge of God. So if we're going to know him, it's necessary that he reveals himself to us. And that we can't, everybody can have the promise of the new covenant through Jesus. So praise God for that. We commune with him. We sing his praise, and we're aware that he personally dwells among us and within us to bless us. So Wayne Grudem said, indeed, this personal relationship with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit may be said to be the greatest of all blessings of the Christian world. And I totally agree with that. While we can know some things about him, he's still the infinite, inexhaustible one. That was the phrase he gave me about himself. So um, while we know that it, we can be his servants, is it possible to be his friend? And, of course, we hear, yep, it's possible. He had some friends that he named, such as um, Abraham, Enoch. He named uh, Moses, and he talked about King David. David is my favorite, I would have to say. And um, so... He's, there's a scripture, Acts 13, 22, and God is talking and he says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. I love this right here, which shall fulfill all my will. And I believe that is such key to our walk with God and discovering who he is, is by doing his will. And when you love someone, you want to do what pleases the Lord. Um, I'm sorry, you want to do what pleases them, but definitely we want to do what pleases God. And I was just sharing with someone this week that I had asked God over the weekend, what can I do to make you happy? How can I please you? Just tell me one thing that would please you today, Father. And I was really shocked at his response, and it was, let me love you. And I was dumbfounded. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> Um, how do I do that? You know, but I think it's just really walking and talking with him in the cool of my day, just like we all can, and resting in God's love, just resting in the fact that he does and thanking him. I just thank you that you love us tonight, Father. And so we can, yeah, we start out serving him and doing all this and doing all that. And, um, but God is so concerned with us individually. He wants to walk and talk with us. And it turns into this love relationship, being his friend. Salvation is free. It is the gift of God in the way we enter into relationship with him. But sanctification and consecration are for those whose lives are hidden with God in Christ and are willing to pay the price to know him intimately. Everything has to be let go of to know the Lord intimately. He's teaching me that personally. Um, and there are scriptures that talk about being his friend and being filled with the fullest measure of the divine presence, and that's in Ephesians 3.19. Rick Joyner says that we're all as close to God as we want to be and that we can enter in by the blood of Jesus. So we, choose, we make the choice, and it's not presumptuous because scriptures are, are full, the scriptures are full of invitations for us to draw near to him, and we were created for that reason, to have fellowship with him. Those who have great reverence for God will be shown his covenant, which is a sacred relationship. So I want to talk about him creating Adam and... I'll kind of try to wrap this up quickly. I'm sorry. I hope I'm not going over my time. Um, okay, so I want to just give one perspective about how important we are to him. Y'all can go look this up online if you want to. If you just go out and look at pictures of space, um, there are pictures of the planet, and it looks like a speck of dust among the myriad of planets and stars in heaven. And yet it's so huge to us. It seems so huge to us, but it really isn't. Okay. And, um, and yet, you know, we're like these little ants on this planet. But here's the deal. It's interesting out of all that God has made that his gaze is on our planet. 
that he looks for us to have relationship with him. Out of all the things, I mean, that boggles my brain, that out of all he made, that he's created us. So here he is, um, you know, one day they're talking about, let's make man in our image. Yeah, let's do it. And so just as I read earlier in Genesis about the Holy Spirit hovering over the planet Earth, over the waters before, while it was formless and lifeless and it was void and empty. I believe that Holy Spirit hovered over the, un, the uh, triune being of God. The, whole, the Trinity was there, and they were hovered over this form that God had made out of the ground that looked like him. And I believe just like a parent looks at their new baby, and they get down kissing all over that face and wanting just to embrace the baby, and love on the baby, that God was just in awe of what he had made himself. And so he bends down. Um, or let me back up for a minute because I like this. I said there must have been such an anticipation about this, first hum- the first human being in the world to have the life of God and the blueprints of God's will now on the inside of him. So he's laying there, and he's, he's unaware. He's, he's lifeless. But then God gently bends down and releases his breath from his spirit, imparting his ruach into Adam's nostrils, and he comes alive. And I believe the Lord, you know, I was thinking about what Adam must have thought when he first opened his eyes, and there's God looking down at him, just right there in his face. So imagine the first set of eyes that Adam sees are God's eyes looking right back. Just this pool of love. Um, You know, just like a parent bends down into the face of their child, the one made in their image and given their name. It's easy to imagine that God did that with Adam. And so, um, you know, I wonder if Adam looked up and said, hey, who are you? (laughs) Who are you? The same question that Moses asked in the, you know, later on. And God's just like, welcome to the world, son. Daddy loves you. I'm your daddy. And so God, the same thing, the Ruach of God, his spirit is being imparted into the new believer, into our spiritual nostrils as we begin our relationship with him. The the word Ruach means breath, wind, and spirit. And so as God creates Adam, um, he breathes life into him. And the first thing he wants to do is go play in the garden. I just love that because I like playing in the yard myself and digging in the dirt. So God takes him, and it must have still been aromatic, you know, with all those plants and everything. And I, this sounds crazy, but um, I love the smell of damp, musty dirt. I mean, I don't know why. Probably because we're made out of it. I don't know, but... Um, Anyway, the garden was beautiful. And so God had made Adam in his image. And, uh, you know, bust forward for 2,000 years. And Andre Agassi, the famous tennis player, said, image is everything. I will agree with that, but I think that the image of God is everything, not the image of man. And we do emanate an image. We're going to either emanate our own image or we're going to emanate his image. We're going to let him shine through us or we're going to try to shine for people. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, and then God sees that everything has something like it except Adam. So he puts Adam to sleep, and he creates this suitable helper for him. So I was just going to say to the guys, um, that's a really great example. Just rest, rest in the Lord, and let him create your wife because he does a better job. And. You know, when she comes along, I'll talk about her in a second. But it's interesting to consider that Eve was made from the framework of Adam, from his ribs, right under his arm. I had read that. And that the ribs are there to protect your vital organs, the things that give you life and keep you, um, that they're vital for a person to live. And that's what a godly wife will do for her husband. She'll protect him. She'll keep him covered because love covers and um, and so also Eve came from inside Adam, and she came from a place close to his heart. And I love that, the thought of that, that God gave Adam the manifestation of the desire of his heart in Eve, somebody like him, 
So she came from man to be joined to man, and then they were joined together by God. Just a, a perfect, perfect marriage. So that's what we're looking for, you know, the perfect man. She had it. And um, so just moving along and trying to quickly wrap this up. She knew instinctively that her function was to support her husband, to be a helpmate to him. And she was equal with him, not inferior to him. Uh, they were best friends, husband and wife. They were lovers and co-laborers together, working side by side. And then, you know, God takes Adam into the garden and he, he gives them instructions about what they can eat, what they can't eat. And then one fateful day, uh, you know, they have the fall. And Eve, cho Eve chose to believe the words of the devil over the words of what God had said because he twisted. He's so sinister and so devious and evil. One thing that stood out to me is that the very sin that got him kicked out of heaven, wanting to be like God, was what he was trying to impart and deceive this person into. And it worked. Because then she desired to be like God, feeling like, you know, he's holding back on us. And so, you know, the enemy still accuses God to us all the time. And we just have to say it is written rather than getting caught in, into a conversation with him. Just say it's written and be gone. Um, so they had been talking with God in the garden daily. And now there's fear where there had been transparency. There was chaos and confusion. And God came looking for them. This was so blessed. I was so blessed by this. He's, here's the first question God ever asked a man. Adam, where are you? Because they were not Adam and Eve. They were Adam. They were one. But after the fall, then she received her own name. You can confirm that in the book of Genesis, chapter 2 and 3. Mm, okay. um, so why would God be calling to them? You know, I believe that it Heaven and earth were merged at that time. There was a spirit realm. There, weren't, there wasn't the heavenly realms and the earthly realm. It was all one. And so um, in the spirit realm at that time, it was perfect. It was a flawless, sinless planet. And so they could see in the spirit realm. They could see angels, they, and there were no demons. Um, they could see, I guess they were. There was a second heaven. But on planet earth, there weren't as of yet, just the devil. And... So they could see God. I believe he was visible to them, and they walked and talked with him. But God comes looking for them, and I believe they were groping around in darkness because sin had ent entered in to their realm. And this shows the love of God, that if they could not see him any longer because they were blinded by sin, that he's calling to them like a parent would cause to a child so that the child can find their way back to the parent, not for the beating they're going to receive, but for uh, just, you know, I'm here. I love you. Yes, there's consequences, but I love you, and that nothing will ever change that. So they were banished from the garden. God did not leave them out of the garden exposed, and I love that because love covers. Unfortunately, there was the first killing that took place, and God had to sacrifice the animal to cover them. But he led them out covered. And that's what he does with us. He leads us out of that place of sin covered. We're covered in the blood. So his love never changed for them. Um, there's so much more I could share, but there's just not time. But it just shows that his nature is restorative. And that even when correction has to be brought, it's always to bring um, restoration you know, to the situation, always. He disciplines those he loves according to people. Can I wrap it up quick? Wrap it up. Okay. And so he honors his word above his name. We have to rightly divide the word. And, that, and we do that through getting in and getting to know him, getting into the scriptures. And so in conclusion, we discovered a lot about him, talked about a lot of different things, his creation, his, his character, his attributes, his nature, and he's extended this invitation to us to know him. If we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. Um, there will never be words on in heaven or on earth that could ever 
give worthy description of him because who he is cannot be captured in any language. So last of all, for to eternity, a million years or more from now, there will still be the unfolding of light at every beholding of his beautiful face. And our hearts will continue to be captivated by our Father in heaven, who is beyond tracing out, but he has made it entirely possible for us to know who he is. Amen.